first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, you know, the, these gatherings are not uh, simply thrown together. We do not reach out to everyone. Uh, and so we're honored by having such a competent crew as you. And we're, we're banking on you adding value by asking questions and making comments uh, on the brief presentations we're going to hear tonight. We're going to have three. And the uh, method, to the extent there is any, is this. Yes, we're concerned about AUKUS. But AUKUS, as is explained on the website, if we're if we're at all lucky, it might be a model rather than just a one off. If it's a model, it might be that the United States and some European country or group might strike other high tech defense related collaborative uh, deals, if you will, with Japan and South Korea or, you know. That there be more. Um, you know, there, there may never be an Asian NATO, but something like this might make a lot of sense for all parties. And and so the, the, what's interesting about AUKUS is it's sort of its model as much as what it actually includes technically and whether it can be at all emulated uh, further. Now, in that regard, uh, it's pretty clear that one of the areas which is even, I think, covered in AUKUS, is uh, space technology and space services that relate to military missions. And, you know, this can be an awkward topic uh, in, in places like Japan, uh, but it's also become less so, uh, I think, in fairness, uh, in the last two to three years. And you hear more discussion of the military relevance of Japan's uh, space activities. We thought we'd take this straight on and try to learn more about it. Um, I should note, as I did earlier, uh, that South Korea is uh, also a pretty important uh, space power in its own right. I mean, they just did a, a, a launch of a, of a uh, rather large rocket that put I don't know, 1.3 to 1.5 tons into orbit, lots of different satellites. I mean, they clearly, you know, want to want to move in this area. Uh, and I, I think I've talked with Brian about this uh, and we want to do a dedicated um, session on, on that. Uh, the next session, I should say right up front, will bring us back to Oz uh, and, and AUKUS. And that is with a new government um, there, uh, there's been a bit of uh, candor uh, that, well, maybe we need to do something to take care of our um, submarine mission uh, in the interim before these submarines that we're talking about might come online. And they, they've noted that they think the, the submarines may not come online until the 2040s. Uh, you know, and so you know, there are lots of interim things they would like to talk about. I think we would like to, to talk about that and try to get the most intelligent people from the States and uh, Australia in. And, you know, if all possible, try to get someone from the UK as well. So that will be the next session. But I think after that, we will turn to the space matter um, for South Korea and, and learn what what the session would generate. So uh, with that in mind, we have three presentations tonight. Uh, the first of which I want to make sure what, what is the order, uh, Bailey? I believe Mr. Yumita is first. Um, Kome is second, and then I think Sam is Sam is, is third. I could okay. be wrong though. No, no, that sounds right. Um, now, uh, you can you can you know see the the um, the bios, but it, essentially our first speaker is a director uh, in Washington of what's roughly Japan's NASA, uh, which is a you know a civilian 
um, mission and they you know focus on space ex exploration uh, the, the second speaker um, it will be someone with more of a if you will defense patina uh, on the topic he's he's at the Hudson and served many years in the defense ministry and knows a good deal about the space policy issues as well and then finally uh, we have our American our token American <laughs> That's, that's Sam, uh, who works at you know, aerospace and has been focused on uh, Japanese and South Korean space programs and how the United States uh, could work more closely with both of those programs for military as well as commercial uh, benefits. So that's, that's the lineup, and why don't we begin? Okay, thank you very much uh, for kind introduction. Um, so I guess I have to start first. Um, yes. Yeah. So just one. Uh, the so the correction for my title. So I'm deputy director at the Jackson. Oh, you're National deputy director. Office. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I yeah, gave you a promotion. I have, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will. Yeah. Later on, I will try to do that. So, I, yeah, I apologize. For now, yeah. No problem. At all. So. Thank you for the introduction, though. But um, my name is Kota Umeda, uh, so and the deputy director at the Jackson DC office. Um, and um, so before the, you know, the uh, before my opening remarks, I have to declare that um, the the view expressed in this session is solely completely my own personal opinion, and does not represent any, um, you know, Jackson's official stance or any other organization. And I just need to do that. And with that, um, so the you know the other two panelists, I believe, will you know more like focus on the national security space. So I'd like to a little bit talk about the civilian space cooperation between Japan and the United States. And there are you know there is a long history of the you know the cooperation uh, you know between two countries. So maybe you know you know just. Give you the sense of how we came to this point, you know, between Japan and U.S. space cooperation, and we are, what which direction we are going. So let me, um, you know, pull up my slide. Um, can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, I know that I have a limited time that um, they I have for this opening remarks, so I'll be gonna be a little bit quick. Um, so the, I just, you know, the, uh, you know, the made a stride that is very, very important uh, the, for the Japan and the US uh, for the civil space cooperation, but this does not really cover everything, but just, you know, um, the huge milestones. So, the looking back uh, like 50 years ago when the you know um, Apollo 11 landed on the moon in 1979, the the Japan actually did not have any the capability to you know to launch the satellite into the orbit. It was still struggling to you know uh, you know conducting the you know the the launch vehicles the experiment, and it was only 1970s that you know we succeeded in the, the you know putting satellites in, into the orbit though it, the rocket itself was small and it was the you know the three rocket booster uh, so it was difficult to um, the you know the launch the huge or medium to, to you know the heavy you know satellites into orbit but having said that it was the the, the very uh, huge milestone for, for Japan space program. At the same time, however, we needed to Japan Japanese government needed to um, the you know uh, develop the larger launch vehicle to put a um, more like operational satellite such as meteorological communication the the other satellites into into the orbit which are the you know the heavier than the you know the scientific payloads. So the uh, and when we look at the United States at the time, U.S. had a long history and heritage of the developing and the launching the, uh, you know, the, the large launch vehicles. So those vehicles are based on these liquid propellant rockets, 
and rigid propane rocket is actually easier to um, to you know make it bigger. So the Japan and the United States government negotiated in the late 60s, and um, the the U.S. agrees to transfer rigid propane technology to Japan in, and it was agreed uh, uh, in the 1969. And based on that. Uh, so-called N1 rocket was developed and launched in 1975, and um, this rocket um, is the, the basis for the, the current JAXA rocket, um, so-called H2A, and that is the workforce of the um, you know our the the capability to for the space access, and um, the which is of course much bigger, but but the, when we look at the history, we can trace back to the N1 rocket. And so from the beginning, we had the you know, Japan and the US had the you know, cooperation of the space development. And look at the United States portion, you know, there's nothing on the 70s, but um, the in 1972, US government um, you know, started the space shuttle program and they invited um, other countries to join, including Japan and Japanese government um, you know, they study what to do with that invitation, and they, and it took a long time, but four years, but they, they decided that basically um, concentrate on the, you know, developing satellite and launch vehicles at that time, because the, you know, they, it, the early 70s was the, really the beginning of the actual, you know, operation and um, you know, development of the, you know, uh, the satellite and launch vehicles. Uh, and they, the Japan, you know, the instead of the uh, the participating in space shuttle development, they decided to join as the in terms of utilization. Um, so shuttle mission started in 1981, um, and the Japanese astronaut, um, you know, the West get on board in 1992 to utilize the space environment. Um, and that was the beginning for Japan's space, uh, human space flight. Um, and after 1992, there are many Japanese astronauts on the space shuttle or the other, you know, the spacecraft. And you know, we continuously send them, um, you know, the, you know, the uh, astronauts um, at this time on the you know, International Space Station. And also look at the um, you know U.S. side again. In 1984, President Reagan um, announced the you know, space station program, and he invited um, you know Western countries to join it um, at the London summit. Um, and at this time, the Japanese government uh, decided to fully participate in the program. So the there was the um, after that there was the long negotiation um, the and also many design changes of the station program and uh, because of the you know collapse of the Soviet Union Russia later joined on the into the station program so it took a you know very long time from the from the beginning to actual birth of the construction of the ISS that is the um, was started just um, 1998 and Japan developed the, the module so called the Kibo uh, for the space station and um, the, the space shuttle, you know, they brought those modules to the space the station. And um, then also the Japan developed the, uh, you know, cargo vehicle to supply, um, just to the supply the, to the station that includes like food, uh, water, or the, the medical device to the station. And uh, we, you know, launched the, um, the you know, the cargo vehicle is launched from Japan to the station, and we are developing a new cargo vehicle right now called HTVX. So, um, but I was, I want to say is that you know the for Japan, the US was the um, from first um, essential partner, and there was the huge technological gap between the two countries at the beginning. But as Japan you know, accumulated technology and experience in the space system, we, uh, JAXA and NASA are becoming more and more equal partners. And we, now we have so many corporations, not this slide focused on the 
the branch vehicles and the space, human space flight, but we have much more cooperation in all mission areas right now. Um, and one more slide I may have is what, so what we are going to do right from now. So the space station is the, you know, orbiting around the, around the Earth, like the Earth shoot from the ground is like 400 kilometers. So, I mean, that's what, 250, uh, you know, miles uh, from the ground, but we are going to, um, you know, go beyond that. And um, NASA, JAXA, and other international partners are planning to have the uh, the, the orbiting uh, station around the moon, so-called gateway. And also from the gateway, um, the 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 NASA is planning to to um, you know have the astronaut on the surface of the moon. And um, we also the Japan also wants to um, you know they contribute to the mission. And also the the NASA is developing a new heavy launch vehicle to you know send those the you know, modules and astronauts um, you know from the from the Earth to the Moon and Mars, so so called Artemis One. And um, you know the you know JAXA uh, you know provides two CubeSats on the uh, you know the Artemis One, and we are very excited to see the the Uncle test quite in the coming months. And um, also for the Mars, um, we are developing robots, uh, robotic spacecraft to the the Martian moon. So it's not Mars itself, but you know, go to Martian moon called Phobos and get a sample from them. You know, touch down and get a sample from them and bring it back to the Earth by 2029. And that mission is also the you know based on the international cooperation with NASA, European Space Agency, uh, Germany, and the France Train Space Agencies as well. So what we are you know doing for space exploration is entirely based on the international cooperation, especially with the United States. And the um, U.S. is reading the uh, you know crafting architecture, and we are also um, as you say, the, the contribute to the mission. So it's it's very very you know the exciting, and we are the, as the equal partner. You know we are uh, well collaboration has been um, you know stronger than never. So I know that the time is limited, so I, I'm going to stop this and um, look forward to the discussion later. Um, and the that. Yeah. All right. Well, that gave us a pretty good overview of the uh, civil programs and the collaboration. Um, but I think we want to learn a little more about what the security implications of such collaboration and other forms of collaboration might be. And for that, uh, we should go to the second speaker. Uh, hello, I'm Komi Suzaki, and uh, I'm a Japan Chair Fellow at the Hudson Institute. Thank you for inviting me to uh, important and fascinating discussions today. Uh, although I'm a um, Hudson Fellow, uh, I still uh, belong to the Japanese Ministry of Defense. And so, oh, I think I'm cautious and uh, <laughs> conservative in explaining the old uh, projects uh, over policies Japan is doing here. Um, also, after the uh, presentation, I think we're going to have uh, discussions and uh, uh, my opinions will be on my own at uh, representing the government uh, or the Ministry of Defense. So, uh, as somebody mentioned uh, in the first part that um, Japan's uh, space uh, policy and the project's activities have been uh, uh, very civilian oriented. So, we have been uh, focusing on the uh, civilian side as uh, led by uh, JAXA. Uh, Umeda san explained uh, very in detail and uh, very to the point. And, but uh, situations of uh, world and Japanese situations around Japan has been changing over the past uh, few decades. So Japan's space policy has been gradually changing and recently more rapidly changing. Um, <clears throat> so, Japanese Ministry of Defense, uh, Self-Defense Forces, 
uh, have been a pure user of the space technologies, uh, purchasing imagery, so using communications, uh, using a commercial satellites. Uh, so they were not operator of the space like the United States Force. But uh, because of the North Korean threat uh, in the 1990s, they have uh, they have uh, launched a ballistic missile, developed and uh, launched ballistic missiles near Japan, Japanese sea, also over the Japanese archipelagos, and uh, Japanese uh, public sentiment and government policies has been changing uh, because of North Korean uh, repeated launching of the ballistic missiles and the showing of demonstration of their capabilities. So first, uh, Japan and the government decided to introduce ballistic missile defense capabilities and also decided to acquire the information gathering satellites. We don't say reconnaissance, it's a too militaristic. So we say uh, information gathering satellites, uh, which was not operated by the Ministry of Defense, but the Japanese cabinet secretariat has a sp uh, launched a satellite center to operate the information gathering satellites. Of course, Japanese Ministry of Defense is a <clears throat> major user of those capabilities. So, uh, 10 years passed since then. Um, January 2007, China destroyed its, its um, uh, satellites using a missile launch from the ground, so so-called ASAT, uh, that produced 3,000 debris in space. It seems uh, they are still experimenting with these ASAT missiles physically or sometimes using uh, some simulations capabilities. Um, also, Russia has been conducting ASAT missile experiments. In December 2020, the United States announced Russia conducted its second ground launch anti-satellite missile launch test in the same year. There are other sat anti-satellite weapons, uh, Japanese Ministry of Defense considers it's, it's very threatening. Uh, other than anti-ASAT missiles, they, many countries such as um, Russia and China are developing the uh, threatening uh, satellites to threats not only using a space, but also in the space as a battlefield. So those uh, development of new space and capabilities by the countries, there, which are not really friendly to us. So these, uh, so these um, activities and movements, uh, including the radio jamming by by the satellite's communication between satellites and ground systems. So those uh, systems pushed uh, Japanese government, or particularly from the congressman, Japanese congressman, to formulate a basic space law in 2008. In, uh, before the basic space law, and Japan was uh, used uh, as the general, generalization theory, uh, we, call, we call it. So, uh, until this, the use of space technology becomes so public or generalized, uh, Ministry of Defense cannot use that technology. But by passing the 2008 law, so that situation changed. Ministry of Defense can part participate or could develop space capability by its own. And so Japanese space de development and utilizations is, has been changing since then. Uh, based on the basic space law, uh, government uh, drafted the plan, basic space plan uh, in 2009. Uh, this was the first ever trial of making comprehensive policy on space activities. So it honestly confessed that it was undeniable that they felt a sense of crisis in the use of, uh, in the use and research and development of space. They pointed three parts. First is absence of general strategy at a country level. Second is insufficiency of track record of space utilization. Uh, this is what is uh, it's a, a, a little difficult to understand. So track record. So I read the document um, in detail, and they seem to be saying the use of space for national security purposes are limited to the level of generalization theory. 
The third one is a lack of international competitiveness because uh, this is a part of industrial strength of space because the market is limited to domestic. And also the uh, development by the military establishment was banned. So uh, perhaps uh, this uh, created situation of lack of international competitiveness in Japan. So these three weaknesses or sense of crisis are identified in the first basic plan. So after the, uh, with the basic plan on space policy, Japanese space policy changed from a pure research and development centrism to three pillars. Uh, first is science and technology. Second is industrial promotion. Third is security. So the phase has evolved into a comprehensive national strategies. The furthermore, in the basic space plan formulated in 2013, four years after the first one, uh, they say from the conventional measures that emphasize research and development of those that emphasize the utilization and clarified exit strategies. So this, they often use the word exit strategies in this year's basic plan. Perhaps uh, exit means, so entry is a kind of research and development from scientific purposes. Exit is kind of Mm -hmm. So national security purposes or disaster relief purposes. So you, we need to have a clear objectives of space development. So that is, I think, perception of the 2013 basic space law. So a new new policy direction was set for this shift. After that, basic space plan was revised several times, um, emphasizing that the security environment surrounding Japan has become more severe and the importance of space in Japan's security has increased significantly. So the uh, latest uh, basic space law was drafted in 2020. Uh, this space basic plan was uh, saying, uh, was created from based on the national security strategy of 2013. This was the first uh, national security strategies of Japan. So, uh, so this national security strategy has an influence on space policy this time. So they say um, the purpose of the space uh, policy is to contribute to various national interests and Japan's industrial and science and technology infrastructure. The goal is to strengthen the comprehensive foundation that supports space activities as contributors to various national interests. So we need to ensure space security and contribute to disaster countermeasures and national resilience and solving global issues. Third is create new knowledge through space science exploration. And the fourth is promoting space. So they express to promote the realization of economic growth and the innovation for their strengths. In this way, they declare very Rather boldly, uh, Japan is aiming to become an independent space power. So I think this is the first time Japan uses the space power in the official documents. So based on these trends, uh, uh, in the context of these trends, Japanese Ministry of Defense and Self-Defense Forces have been um, accelerating their um, capabilities in space areas. So uh, they. Uh, based on the medium-term defense capability develop development plan and relevant documents, the Ministry of Defense uh, is to build a space situation awareness system, SSA system, to ensure the stable use of outer space. Second is to improve various capabilities, such as information gathering, communication, positioning, and navigation using space. A third is to acquire ability to secure the superiority in space use at all stages from normal times to emergencies, including the ability to interfere with the command and control and communication of other parties in cooperation with the electromagnetic field. Fourth is to strengthen cooperation with relevant organizations such as JAXA, JAXA and like-minded countries such as the United States. And finally, uh, to establish a system specializing in space, uh, such as new units, uh, military units, and the professionals in the military establishment. So uh, they are. Uh, so.
so um, SSA is a kind of first arena of the um, Japanese Minister of Defense to explore their own capability with the cooperation of these. They, um, um, in 2020, they established the first space oriented unit, and then they upgraded in uh, next year, 2021. So the expanding and enlargement of the space unit is planned this year as well. Uh, so uh, the real operation of SSA, Japanese SSA system is to begin next fiscal year. So they are also planning to launch a SSA satellite by the year 2026. And also they are um, actively participating in uh, um, trainings and uh, simulations like a Global Sentinel and sending uh, military officers to US Space Command. And so those uh, efforts are focused on SSA. And um, <clears throat> They also recently began the cooperations um, with the National Institute of Information and Communication Technology. We call it NICT, NICT. So uh, these uh, communication areas as well, Japanese Ministry of Defense is enhancing the space use. So to enhance the C4 ISR function, more redundancy is secured for receiving multiple positioning satellite signals, including the quasi Zenith satellite, uh, Michibiki, so Q, we call it QZSS, using commercial satellites. <clears throat> yep. Also, uh, Japan is uh, having a discussion with uh, the other uh, allies like Australia, um, France, and the EU for the space cooperation. So, I think these are the brief summary of the developments from the security side of Japanese space development. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you. Um, and to round out and to broaden a bit, uh, Sam, uh, why don't you uh, give your presentation? Then we will open everything up to Q&A because I think these things, these presentations are so closely tied to one another opening it up after all the presentations makes more sense than not. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sounds great. Um, and first of all, thanks, Henry, for inviting me. And thanks to, to Brian uh, for inviting me. Is he on, Brian Clark? Perhaps. Anyway, I, he's well, on. It, I thank him. Uh, yes. I, he's watching I, it later. He'll see the, the, he, the he, he would have done a better job of, of the, the introductions. I was counting. On, on him, I I apologize for my uh, emergency inadequacies, but uh, no, no, no. yeah, uh, okay, this is great. Right. Um, and and thanks to to Hudson and and Tech for for putting this on. Um, it's also a real pleasure to be here with my friend Coda, um, and, and uh, to to be here with with Kamai as well, whom I I look forward to to getting to know more. Coda and I are actually beginning to work on a a project now. And we plan to, to interview Kamai. So this is uh, really convenient. This event is, is very convenient for my, my research agenda. Uh, and those are both excellent presentations. So, so I'll, I'll try to cover different ground and add something from uh, the US perspective, or rather my perspective on the US perspective. Uh, so I first want to say, talk really briefly about why defense space partnerships are important uh, from the US perspective. And then I, I want to touch on some of the, the reasons why Japan is, is a really compelling country uh, from the U.S. perspective to target for defense-based partnerships. And then Henry also asked me to say a couple words about South Korea. So I'll conclude with that all in seven minutes uh, or, or as close to it as I can. Um, so why space partnerships are important, defense-based partnerships are important. I'll mention three reasons. One is money. Um, operating in space is much more affordable than in the past, but you still, it, it's, it's still very expensive. Um, and, and by partnering, you can, you can save a lot of money. So as, as one example, next year, the United States and Norway will be launching a Norwegian satellite that will have, uh, a U.S. national security sensor payload on it. And space force says that by doing that, they will be saving $900 million. Um, so, you know, the more that you partner and, and share some of these costs, the more that you can do. 
Another reason for why defense-based partnerships are so important is that you can leverage the unique capabilities and technologies of partner nations. Going to Japan, um, uh, Kamai just talked a lot about SSA. You know, one thing that I think is one capability that's really intriguing from a U.S. perspective is is Japan's plans to develop this deep space radar, um, which you know, a radar, a lot of uh, terrestrial SSA capabilities are telescopes, um, which get blocked by atmospheric conditions. Radar doesn't have that problem. Um, and when you're thinking about space situational awareness that could go up to geo and perhaps beyond, and you think about you know some of the the, the counter space threats that might exist in places near Japan, you know this kind of capability I think um, is really attractive. The third reason um, that I'll mention why defense space partnerships are are so important is is deterrence. I think there's a really persuasive argument that by commingling uh, U.S. national security space assets with foreign, with partner, uh, international partner uh, space assets, you make, um, you complicate the adversary's thinking on, on a target, on, on whether it's going to attack that target. Because now if it does, it's not just attacking a U.S. capability, it's not just attacking the United States. But it's also attacking all the, the countries that are tied to that capability. And so when you think about these three, these three reasons why defense-based partnerships are so valuable, um, you know, it, it's clear to see why Japan is, is such an intriguing country for the, for the United States to focus on. First of all, um, it, has, it spends a lot of money uh, on space. It has the fifth highest space budget in the world. Uh, it also has a lot of capabilities that you can try to leverage. Um, it is one of six countries plus, um, plus the European Space Agency that can independently launch into high orbit. Um, it has the intelligence gathering satellite or information gathering satellites, um, as Kamai mentioned, as also as Kamai mentioned, one of five countries in the world that has its own positioning, navigation, and timing satellites. And it also has its own defense sat, SATCOM capabilities. Um, and with respect to deterring Via, um, via developing joint capabilities, the United States and Japan are already working toward this. In the next two years, Japan will be launching, uh, will, be, will be carrying out two launches of its navigation satellites that will be carrying US national security payloads. And this will be the first time that the United States has put an operational national security payload on a foreign satellite and foreign launcher. Uh, the Norwegian example is just on a foreign satellite. So this is, both are, are super historic, um, but uh, Japan, Japan one is obviously really intriguing. So looking to other opportunities, Henry asked me to mention some ideas where this already robust um, relationship could expand. Space situational awareness, uh, I, you know, I completely agree um, that, that that's an area that, that's really compelling um, for, for deeper space partnership. Uh, especially when you know this the the deep space radar I think comes online, um, and we had a we had a report out last year the year before called partnering not bossing and and it discusses how U S has as recently adopted a more flexible approach for improving interoperability uh, with international partners for space domain awareness. Another area more speculative because uh, I first of all so I think. That's that's set, right? Like that's going to grow, and, and I'm sure that that's going to grow intensely over the coming years. An, an area that could be uh, Henry likes, you know, wild ideas um, is missile warning. Um, you know, we didn't in 2020. You know, the the, the national uh, Japan's national space policy introduced this idea that in cooperation with the United States, it was going to study small satellite constellations. With infrared sensors for missile warning, and then last year in the implementation plan of the national space policy, um, it also made similar language about cooperating, potentially developing missile warning um, in conjunction with the United States. And and for the U.S., this is an area with tremendous growth. Um, I'm writing right now a, a a paper on the U.S. defense space budget, and and the story of this year's defense space budget is missile warning, missile tracking huge growth in m multiple orbital regimes. If you're, you know, geosynchronous uh, Earth orbit uh, systems are getting huge increases, polar systems are getting huge increases. We're seeing sustained growth 
uh, we're seeing sustained funding for multiple programs in, in low Earth orbit. And then this year's budget also had funding for a medium Earth orbit. This is the first year where we're seeing um, officially funding for a medium Earth orbit missile warning, missile tracking. So the U.S. is trying to do a lot in this area. So it could be, um, and given you know that Japan is is really um, is thinking about this area too, this could be an area uh, for collaboration. I, I think you know it's hard to say this is such a sensitive area, missile warning, missile tracking, whether the U.S. Um, would really do something like this jointly or partly jointly. I, I think it's hard to say, but if they were to, I think Japan is, you know, a really intriguing country um, for them to think about. So, uh, in my last minute or two, I'll talk about South Korea. What a day to discuss South Korea, by the way, the day after uh, the country for the first time launched a real working satellite off aboard its own domestic rocket. Um, you know, to me, South Korea uh, is a country that I think we should be, the U.S. should be targeting for much deeper defense-based collaboration. And, and unlike with Japan, our defense-based engagement with South Korea has been relatively limited. I did a project a couple years ago um, for a government customer where we were asked to think about which countries we would prioritize for, for deeper defense-based partnerships. And the country that kept Hearing really, really compelling, really, really attractive was South Korea. South Korea is an extremely high tech country. Um, it has a highly skilled workforce. In fact, it has the most, it has more researchers per capita than any other country in the world. Uh, it also has one of the biggest economies in the world that is growing at a really high rate. Both of those are great indicators for um, more investment in space. Um, and it's already a space nation with serious, ambitious uh, space plans. In August last year, South Korea announced uh, that it was going to do as part of a 10, or it was going to do a 10 year investment um, worth uh, 13 billion US dollars into military space activity. They're considering early warning capabilities as well. Um, they're pursuing reconnaissance satellites. Uh, they have plans to develop their own positioning navigation and timing satellites. They wanna do more on space situational awareness. And, and they're also interested in developing a thriving commercial space sector. Um, along these lines, uh, there's lots of current commercial investment in satellite production. Hanwha Systems announced a 2000 satellite constellation that would be supplemented by the Korean uh, Aerospace uh, or Advanced uh, Institute for Science and Technology, uh, whenever that, okay, you're, you're motioning me to the hands. Um, my last minute, you know, with respect to the United States, there's already some collaboration. In August last year, August was a, a big month for Korean uh, space announcements. The U.S. Space Force and Republican, or the Korean Air Force um, announced they created a joint consultative body for, for collaborating on space policy. Um, space Force, or Sp uh, South Korea has participated in some, some exercises and drills, similar to the ones that um, Kamai mentioned. And much of this coordination has been on space situational awareness. I, I do think that area will grow. And, and I think these are good steps, but there's still a lot of potential for growth. So I, as a final comment, I'll just say, you know, I think the, there are some positive signs that the U.S. is starting to treat defense-based partnerships as a strategic objective rather than as an afterthought. Um, and with that future engagement, I think Japan and South Korea should be serious priorities. Okay. Well, I think that gives a, a sort of a prima facie uh, set of arguments for the conclusion Sam just reached. But, you know, uh, how does this work? Um, I'm curious to get questions and comments. We We have some people who, you know, our leaders in the commercial world, um, and I, I'm kind of curious to see how they think about things because some of their commercial services are increasingly being tapped. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say for military purposes, but but to help uh, countries uh, that are actually, in the case of Ukraine, literally fighting. Um, 
Is there a clear line uh, between civil, commercial, and military activities? Um, I know there we have lawyers, you know, who are at pains to figure out when and where to say no to things. I, how does this work? Uh, curious to get questions and comments. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to stir the pot here to get them. Uh, you can go into uh, the chat room, or if you're really, really hot on something, um, I think it, you can raise your hand. Um, okay, well, uh, Melissa, why don't you uh, at least comment what you would like more to hear about? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Henry. I suppose one of the things I was really interested, thanks to to all the speakers and particularly the emphasis that um, Japan has on space situational awareness. So there was a big announcement uh, last month that um, uh, Japan and, and particularly, you know, the Air Self-Defence Force was going to acquire um, SSA services from Leo Lab, you know, a big US um, commercial provider. So I'd be really interested to hear a little bit more about how um, self defense JAXA uh, are both interested in working in a commercial partnership with the commercial providers and how that might be scaled out as well. Um, do you want to pause? So uh, I think I. Um... Not SSA specific, but um, Japanese Ministry of Defense is uh, point is is also noting the the emergence of uh, new uh, space um, companies um, in Japan and bro more broadly in the world. And also, I think it's 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 using those um, in innovations of uh, space industries are uh, it makes sense. And then the, just the government is talking only in the government. So. I think uh, um, working with the commercial uh, sectors uh, is, is, I think, essential in, in the development of a space situation awareness. And maybe it's not direct answer to you, but as a JAXA's role for the you know, space situation awareness, so we have been, you know, since we have been operating our satellites for a long time, we have the capability to monitor the our satellites, we have the ground sensors, uh, optical telescope, and also the, the system to process that. And um, we are now operating the system. So we are, of course, partnering with that, at this time, Japanese you know, commercial industries to, you know, the upgrade our system. And, and our, you know, data will be provided to the, um, you know, the Ministry of Defense of, of the, you know, and they will be the, the, in Japan Center for the, you know, uh, SSA, you know, the, the system. And um, so we are actively working with the, you know, MOD to um, have a better, you know, uh, you know, collaboration with them. Um, Robbie, uh, could you... Uh share your thoughts that you just put on the uh, the chat room with us. Yeah, happy to. Um, hi, thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Ravi. I'm the co-founder of Planet uh, Earth Observation Company, uh, and we operate uh, about 250 satellites in space. Um, and um, really, this question came up in, in listening to the presenters. You know, we have five different operational PNT systems that are up in space. Um, <clears throat> over many, many, many decades. And with um, uh, collaboration uh, across our shared security interests and investments going into space-based situational awareness, um, how might we learn from um, making an architecture in such a way where there can be national development of capacity and capabilities, but when put into space, it joins a broader network that then it increases the fidelity, the uncertainty, and the understanding of uh, the, the the space environment for a safe and secure space activity. I, I think there, there's an opportunities to learn from this so that we don't end up with competing national systems or too reliant on something that becomes a global good 
uh, that is controlled by a um, one particular nation's military. I think that actually is a really uh, useful question. I'd, I'd love to hear what people think about this because uh, more often than not, we see each country wanting to duplicate what the other country near it is doing. And you sort of wonder, um, uh, is that adding value or just showing that we all want to have our own? Uh, <laughs> is there some value added in linking anything up? It would be, it'd be nice if it was true. Thoughts? Yeah, Henry, may I, may I jump in? It's, it's a really yeah. terrific question. And, and Melissa's question was really good too, but it was not, not my area. But, um, you know, SSA is really interesting area for thinking about uh, commercial and, you know, government in, engagement, because you know, I think part of the problem for commercial vendors for SSA is they don't want to necessarily sell their data that then is free, right, to the U.S. government, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and like, because they want to they make money off. I mean, I think ideally you would have something where you could have a really great fusion of all these these all, from all these different places. The problem is, is I I think you know you they also you know want to make money right like and as they should and and so you know I think what I think could happen right if you have this eventual if Congress funds it if you have this eventual split between civil SSA and and DOD SSA. So you'd still have Spacecom kind of doing its own thing. But then you would have uh, civil SSA, which would really be more, and you have you know, a non-military non agency in the US government leading this, um, but it would really be much more of a, of a way for people to send certain data that, um, you know, baseline data and the government would pay for it. Um, but you'd still have the Leo labs of the world who could, who could create more specialized information for planet, right? I, I think you guys buy Leo labs data for, for SpaceX, whomever, right? Especially some of these big constellations. Um, and then you could have a much more integrated international framework, but I think that civil piece has to happen because you're right. It's, you know, it shouldn't all be just orchestrated through Spacecom. Um, but when you get, and they've been, you know, the government's been talking, the US government's been talking about this for a while, um, but if you get that civil element, then I think there's a way to buy at least some, some data from the commercial actors, as well as, you know, get, have some uh, international data, and it would be much less of a US uh, completely controlled thing, which is what, what is on the defense side, versus, you know, some sort of forum where people can, you know, folks can add information. Well, uh, Robbie, yeah, just to comment you know, on that, uh, real sure, quickly please, too. And, um, and then then we'll go to uh, Michael Gates and then Melissa. But I do want to hear right. what what you have to say, Robbie. I yeah, we all um, do. I I think the um, I think Sam, you're 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 spot on. We you were mentioning the benefits of of doing uh, space collaborations with um, uh, with or defense space project partnerships. Uh, and the second one was, a, or the third one was about uh, deterrence, right? Um, and um, and also to uh, uh, to the point that Henry was making at the at the beginning of the of of the discussion, uh, there's a blurring line between what's happening in civil and commercial and, and government. And then the more that society is actually leveraging a an operational service, it then becomes even more disruptive, right? To your deterrence point. Uh, and I think when it comes to space situational awareness, it's something that everybody needs. Um, and it is part of a rules based society, right? Which uh, we want to continue to, to, to promulgate. Um, and we want it to be a resilient architecture. Uh, so I believe what's happening in 2020 space is that we're actually moving into a domain where uh, this is a you know, critical infrastructure for a habitable planet, comms, position, um, um, and, and all of these early warning systems and freedom of navigation and space traffic management, et cetera. It's all useful for military, civil, and commercial. And that um, commercial um, can create products that are a little bit different uh, than the way that we're used to taking a look at the products or how we, we create capacity in space, which is it's a product, it's upgradable, it's a service, 
and industry is actually good at making that cost effective. And the more people that actually use it, the lower cost it is per user, which then means that then more people can actually come in to actually utilize it. So I think this 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 is uh, SSA architecture in space. Um, it is an opportunity to think about that from more of a uh, 2020 space perspective uh, and to purchase a service. You can still have premium services that then companies can then commercialize on for bespoke and, and, and specific purposes. Um, but there, there's, a, there's a great opportunity there, and that's where standards are important. Uh, that's where an open architecture is important. Uh, so whoever is thinking through that, and maybe that's that aerospace or, or other places, um, I, I think it's a tremendous opportunity for, um, for collaboration uh, across civil, government, commercial, um, and democratic nations um, all around the world. Yeah, and and Henry, if I could just add, do a two fingers. I thought that was Rob, Robbie. That that was so well put. I, you know, I think I really love that when you started the first question by talking about PNT, because I think the danger is you don't want to do what PND did, right? And that GPS is in this incredible system that is free, and so you don't have any commercial actors that are going to develop their own Neo PNT system, right? You do have actors that are thinking about the margins, but you don't want that for SSA, especially because you have already all this great commercial SSA stuff, and you have a lot of countries that have really good SSA stuff. So how can we think about this? How can we try to keep their incentives in place, um, but integrate this at a certain level? Because that's going to be much better to you, right? Instead of just using Leo Labs uh, radars and telescopes, you're able to use, you know, a, a fused a fused network uh, of, uh, of of data, right? So so anyway, that's uh, I well put, and it's a great challenging issue. I'm curious uh, just to hear. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm doing a two finger, <laughs> which is boorish, but we've got a little time. Um, you know, I, I think you, Sam, said, "Well, the U.S. would would do this, and the U.S. would do that." Is 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 that? Uh, because we need to, or is it because we're used to doing it? Or is there some other way that you could uh, encourage and organize these fusing uh, efforts but without it necessarily having a headquarters in Washington? And I'm just curious how that, you know, what, you're, what everyone's thinking is on that. And anyone can answer that, by the way. But I, I'd be curious, the, the two of you, Robbie and Sam in particular, I'm curious to get a sense, and I'd like to hear from our Japanese and Korean friends as well. I mean, this is not a desirable solution, but I mean, the obvious one would be to to not give data from uh, for for U.S. government not to issue conjunction warnings, right, and not to provide data. That then, you know, the commercial sector like has incentives to sell data to the government, and but but then like. But it is a common good, right? And, and so, you know, this is this is, I think, it's a it's a it's a complicated challenge. And I think, you know, finding creative kind of middle solutions is the way to do it. You want to be able to have free conjunction warnings. Um, you want to have specialized uh, commercial SSA. You want to have some integration. Um, and so it may be just sort of an imperfect median, um, you know, between these, but that's, that's at least how I see it. All right. Any more uh, comment on that? Jump in the, it, it, I totally agree with some, you know, the SSA information from the US government, it's, it's international common goods. And, um, without that, you know, we, of course, have the commercial companies that are growing and they are. You know, they could provide quite good, you know, the the product, the information, you know, but the, still the the benchmark for the of the, the those commercial services is still the data from the U.S. government, you know, a space command and space force. So that the, the for the interim for the foreseeable future, um, the it's really really uh, you know essential for the all the you know space operators to have the you know. Um, you know, access the information from the U.S. government. Yeah, I'd add one thing, which is uh, to to take a look at how um, to learn from the internet, a, a new domain, a new frontier. 
and um, you know, ICANN was was actually created by the Department of Commerce by giving a ten million dollar grant to a nonprofit. And so then you had a a nonprofit uh, that that controls the the standards of stuff that then allowed for a good participation architecture across society, um, which then led to um, standards interoperability commerce and what we know of today as as the internet. Um, and I think that there's some lessons learned in that. Again, to juxtapose, juxtapose, juxtapose that to the public good of the PNT signals that came out of GPS. Uh, because, uh, you know, started from the Navy, went to the Air Force, and then is controlled by the US military. And so there still is always, what if, you know, what if that's turned off for me? That's not good for my own national security. I'm not protecting my people. I need to be able to have that capability uh, because of that cap because of how it's governed. So when it comes to public goods, when it comes to infrastructure, um, I do think that that's an, an opportunity uh, to innovate in governance so that it is shared for the global good rather than um, global good because it's at our particular national security right now and for the foreseeable future but it's just a waste of collective resources. Uh, Michelle Gates, uh, first of all, I guess I'm going to have to assume the name of Henrietta Sikalski. I apologize <laughs> for bastardizing your first name and changing your gender. <laughs> I really did not mean to do that. Uh, Michelle, uh, you had a comment uh, and uh, I think it's closely related to this discussion. Why don't you share it? Is she no longer with us? She's on mute, I think. Uh, Miss Gates. Sorry. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> I um very strongly agree with the suggestion regarding the resilient um, I think had a real challenge trying to enable architecture development without doing it completely top down. Um, or um, completely participatory. So the structure that includes standards, interoperability, um, common understanding, rules and norms, I think would be very, very helpful. My question um, in particular was about the fact that the discussion um, we, we, we tend to have discussions on systems development partnerships, partnerships and launching. We talk about cost efficiencies, but it's also really important to be able to communicate about the results of the information gathering. Um, and Kome had talked about um, the increase in information gathering and the orientation of that in information gathering effort to national security. Um, I guess I'd like to just pause it, given the discussion that any consideration of a resilient architecture also include ways to have open communication between countries and between entities on the results of the imaging. Uh, you know, actually, uh, that is a super important comment, uh, both for open exchanges and even classified ones, because yeah, we in the United States have figured out how to overclassify an awful lot to make it difficult to do the right thing, working with close military allies. And it, it you know, this has got to be looked at. Uh, you don't know, maybe eliminate uh, protection of information, but you may want to lower it. And in uh, and, and in some cases, yeah, you may want to eliminate it. It's a big problem. Yes. And with the emergence of increased awareness beyond LEO, beyond GEO, at GEO, our ability to react quickly as a community is going to be increasingly important. I think that gets to the part of the resilience Robbie was talking about. Anyway, thank you. Well, thank you. I think it's uh, the order now is uh, Melissa followed by uh, Michael Fletcher. Uh, and why don't we, why don't we go down that, that line? I think, um, my question follows on really from Michelle's moving from the sort of 
you know, the technical proficiency to saying, well, part of the point of having all of this, this SSA is, is to understand issues to do with, you know, space traffic management and security. So I'd be interested to hear from, you know, any of our speakers about what, what role this might suggest for Japan in, in an increased um, voice as a, as a, you know, uh, trusted player, as a, as a uh, increasing space power in terms of participating in the development of norms about um, good behaviours in space, you know, further participation in the UN open-ended working group on responsible behaviours in space. So how, do, how does a, the sort of technological proficiency then translate into um, the development of responsible behaviours and, and leading by good behaviour? If I may add this is something, um, I think uh, Japan has been very active in the uh, rule making and uh, good behavior in the space, but um, it is just diplomacy and uh, providing um, professors to the meetings. Uh, but now it's Japan is now catching up with um, what we said to uh, what we can do in a uh, safe in the safety of the operations in the space, and uh, maybe we could share um, um, someday and. Um, with the, the information we collected from space situation awareness. Of course, that is a commercial aspects on the security aspects, so we have to be careful. But uh, sometimes if, because space is a public um, global commons, I think uh, it, it would be, uh, if it's um, uh, public, uh, good for public interest, I think we sometimes need to share declassifying uh, some of the information. So we. We, we 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 see these um, actions um, by the United States in, in uh, imagery areas as well. So we they can sometimes declassify and and um, provide to the uh, public about the imageries in uh, South China seas or sometimes in other parts of the world. And um, you know, speaking of the rule makings and the standards uh, from the space agency perspective, um, the we. Um, you know, JAXA has been participating in the you know, various the uh, you know rule making bodies such as IADC, uh, the Agency Space Debris Coordination Committee, or the UN Copiers, or you know ISO, or so many um, the, the the standard organizations. So the you know uh, we try to um, the you know the provide information and provide you know technical knowledge what is the really feasible and the achievable and the reasonable rules would be um, and the the government you know the Japanese government like um, you know the MOD or the uh, you know uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs the, you know um, you know more you know as a diplomatic body you know participating in the discussion and we of course try to um, have um, the the, as much clear and um, you know, as, as you say, the, as much transparent news as possible. Mr. Fletcher. Yeah, um, well, it's great to see you guys. Uh, it, I think Sam mentioned it was hot and it was in the low 80s where I am in the Silicon Valley. It's closer to 100. Um, so that's why I'm in a t-shirt today, as I told Kota. Uh, I, I had a couple of questions. I guess they're sort of back to back here. Maybe uh, Henry, if it's all right, I'll just uh, yeah, well, no, I'll let take you over. let you decide. But um, first question really has to do uh, I address uh, I think more to Islexa, and um, you know we I think we talked about this a little bit, but maybe for the group um, in the U.S. There's been a, a pretty significant movement by the DoD. For security space purposes, to uh, go to commercial based services, I, that's something that that NASA I think really started, but the DoD has picked up, and that hasn't really. It seems like there's a lot of benefit for that, for cost, and also for promoting the commercial sector. Um, and I'm curious as to what DoD, what you think MOD's position is, and if that's going to happen in Japan, or uh, if if not, sort of why not, and uh, what 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 makes Japan a little bit different than the U.S. in terms of adopting commercial services? Um, I think Japan is is of the scale 
of the budget is much smaller than the U.S. And so I think we are um, capacity is limited. But I think the direction of using uh, commercial uh, companies, also maybe promoting commercial companies to make some innovative uh, development of space is, I think, uh, Japanese MOD is is welcome. Um, of course, but we cannot catch up with the, you know, we cannot, may not be able to secure enough budget for them. But uh, I think the direction of the uh, MOD is is not so contradictory to the, what the U.S. is doing here. Um, um, perhaps Japan, in, in Japan's case, as a, as in the space development history, uh, Ministry of uh, Education and uh, Science and Technology have a more budget than they are doing their own uh, science um, projects and providing commercial sectors. I think that is that is. So I think MOD can align with those um, uh, Ministry of Education Technologies um, movements, and and they are. Uh, I think I I feel that uh, and eight years ago uh, when I was responsible for space policy in MOD, that uh, next is um, is is becoming much closer to the MOD's uh, effort. And that's why I think JAXA can cooperate with us. I, I agree with that. I think that's uh, key, actually, going forward. Um, Henry, should I go ahead and ask the next question? Kind of related, actually. Okay. Well, go ahead. <laughs> um, this is more towards Sam, I think, but um, the transport layer is really uh, what SDA is doing is generating a lot of interest. Okay, now, time out, time out. You get to use um, words, but not acronyms and not terms of art. <laughs> Assume we're all high school students, please. Go ahead. Okay. Transport layer. The transport layer. Acronyms. Yes, the transport yeah, layer talking? is a project or the program that uh, the Space Development Agency is, is managing. And that's putting uh, high bandwidth uh, communication links in space and uh, opening up a lot of opportunities for a lot of different players. And the question I had has to do with um, how do you think that other uh, countries, uh, in this case, uh, Japan, but not just necessarily limited to Japan, can participate in the transport layer, should they tr participate in the transport layer for uh, strategic purposes? And how do you see that? And and what kind of barriers do you think there might be in terms of uh, preventing something like that from happening? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think, um, you know, on its face, the transport layer would be it is much. Um, it'd be easier to persuade some uh, traditional DODers that. Uh, the transport layer we could do with international partners in contrast with um in contrast with the tracking layer which is the missile warning uh the missile warning missile tracking layer um but I, I don't know if japan has as much interest i mean you know japan is they have a couple defense satellite communications capabilities already you know japan uh, i think and, and let me defer to the Japanese experts on this too, but like, you know, there is, um, you know, it doesn't seem as if Japan is going to be having its military forces far outside Japan anytime soon, right? So what, you know, do you need, you know, how much global uh, SATCOM services do you need? And, you know, especially with the proliferation of so many of these commercial uh, SATCOM services, is that really what you want? I, I think, you know, I, I think Japan really wants um, missile warning, right? Like they really want missile warning, missile tracking, um, but it's really expensive. It's really hard. There's a reason why only two countries have missile warning uh, capabilities. And, you know, I don't think you can even call what the U.S. has, even though they have the most sophisticated system in the world, as missile tracking either, right? So it's really, you know, it's, uh, so there's, I think it's, you know, I, I see this as Japan is really concerned with a lot of the missile threats. And and Kamai said this earlier that, you know, so much of their evolution toward a more more focus on defense space activity has been built on uh, missile threats, right? Like whether it was Korean tests in the 80s and the 90s, 
um, North Korean missile tests in the 80s and 90s that, that drove the information gathering satellites and then um, some of their, their broader turn towards, you know, rejecting the generalization theory, um, the basic space plan of 2008. I think a lot of that um, was about missile threats. So to me, this, this makes sense that they're interested in it. And I mean, I think it would be great if we could do this jointly with Japan, at least in some way. Um, but I just, I just don't know. Um, why don't we, uh, uh, Robbie, you had two comments and then I think, uh, if I am tracking correctly, I think, uh, Michelle had, uh, two comments. Why don't we go in that order? You so first. The, the first one is, um, the vice president announced the, the, the U S moratorium and direct a set, uh, direct to send a set testing. Um, Canada, Switzerland also, uh, um, came on to that, signed on to that moratorium. Um, and, you know, one question would be, uh, given our shared security, um, and, um, um, uh, you know, what would need to be true for Japan to sign up for it and to be bold, what would need to be true for South Korea to sign up for it today, the day after they first launched their own satellite, how cool would that be? But, but I think it would be great if we actually have. Uh, the Western nations that have sovereign launch capabilities um, to sign up for for such a moratorium, and that will actually help uh, in the international activity. So that's number one. And number two is, um, uh, you know, the 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 are we coordinating our space collaboration also via uh, the Quad? Um, and I know that there is an action that's out there for that, uh, but you know, the more that this deep expert group can then support um uh you know our leaders in our respective countries in order to then have uh, a really good strategy associated with uh with our shared security when it comes to space to bring that into our shared security that's on earth i think can really cement in and accelerate uh, quite a bit of um, interoperable investments so they're both around space security comments michelle Uh, Ms. Gates. Yes. There you are. There you are. I don't you have, have some I, comments. So I I'm waiting with bated breath for responses to Robbie's excellent questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I you, you can tell them. people are overly eager to answer them. Um, they're they're very it might, good. It might, be, it might be too too close to discussions that are already happening, but uh, and so you know maybe we should be thinking well, or, the next or, one or, out or where or we not. can. <laughs> and if or they not. aren't, like we should we should honestly be like, hey, this is bloody simple. Um, the 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 the, the moratorium on direct ASAT testing is easy to give up because it's it's dumb. Oh. Um, and and so like I I do think that that is something that like helps to actually. Um, get toward some building blocks for for better interoperability, better security, uh, and collaboration. So I'm a strong advocate for it, but I'm just a private sector person. Well, if we can get any comments from our speakers, that might be helpful. As as Code is is deciding how he's going to balance this very, this very <laughs> difficult answer, I'll just say that what's saying that's something that's been really cool. Um, that's been cool since. The Russian uh, most recent Russian direct ascent ASAT test and the moratorium is how many commercial players came in and and talked about how important this was and you know it was the kind of you know the 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 diplomatic activity you just didn't see from commercial players and it was just, it was really cool to watch Planet um, was one of the leaders uh, in that you, you saw Leo Labs who we've been talking about today. Um, make statements to, these, to this effect. So I, I was really encouraging um, seeing so much private sector leadership on this issue that is, you know, and if you think about space, it is mostly commercial satellites, right? So they stand to lose uh, the most from this. So I, I think that that was really, really cool and, and unique uh, from the past. And um, I guess Komei-san and myself, uh, can, it's difficult to say Japan's government stance and um, 
but I can I can say personally is that you know the the Mofer uh, you know, made a statement that you know they welcome the 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 ASAP ban by the United you know, US government, and the other point is the you know we, we it's you know generally speaking um it, it's we we have to change um something I mean we have to in order to make um you know standards and do of the uh, the space operation we have to change something and I I I, I believe that this the this the you know, announcement of the you know US government was the one step for as a try, a very good try to to do that. Yes, um agreed. Um I think the uh, I don't I don't know the real exact uh, official position of Japan, but the looking but the reading the government documents including the defense white paper uh, they repeatedly say the the risk and the threats uh, posed by the physical destruction of satellites. So I think uh, I, I think the Jap Japanese government is really willing to uh, promote moratorium on uh, ASAP testing, and and perhaps um, from my imaginations, uh, as the space agencies in the world, including commercial companies, are developing or researching how to to now the satellites uh, without destroying physically. I think they can push uh, the satellites over the uh, orbit without destroying it. Yeah. Claude question, Henry, if I, I could take yes. a stab at, at um, Robbie's second question. You know, outside of some exercises and drills and, and wargaming, we're, we're still kind of at the only bilateral um phase for for defense based partnerships uh, you know i i work closely with our international partnerships team and and it's you know it's it's still it takes a long time right like the the norway uh launch that i mentioned will be next year that that's the first time we're ever putting a national security payload on a foreign satellite um and it's it's crazy to me that we've been in you know we've been operating in orbit for six decades and this saves nine hundred million dollars, and we haven't done this yet. But it's just it's been hard um, changing behavior. And so when you were talking about really serious uh, defense uh, defense space collaboration, it's it's only happening at the bilateral level now. Now, hopefully, that'll change. Um, first, I'd like to just see more countries included, including South Korea, where there's still been kind of limited engagement. But um, yeah, hopefully, that'll change. Yeah, I agree, but uh, I, I know that the uh, Shriva war game, uh, which was uh, conducted only among the five like countries now, I think they're getting participation from France, Germany, and Japan, and uh, possibly South Korea someday. And so I think uh, bilateral, but um, I think uh, it's a hub and spoke system, the so US is centered, and then other countries are bilaterally connected, but, uh, but through US system, I think they we can be more going toward the multilateral cooperation. Yeah, and, and the, the the combined space operations center has uh, not just the five, but also France and Germany. I, I keep expecting to read the news one day and Japan will be part of it. I know there's been yes. discussions along yeah. running. I think Italy and, and South Korea aren't too far behind. Um, you know, even in, we're just a research center, but you know, we have a couple of British officers in our office who sit in our office, we have a German uh, DLR, um, and I, I'm sorry, Henry, I don't know what that initialism stands for, but a German Deutsch, space operator. Deutsche Land something. <laughs> <laughs> we have, we have a German, uh, space operator too, which you didn't see a couple of years ago. So it's definitely getting better, but it's still kind of early stages. Well, I, we're kind of approaching the, the witching hour. I, I always say nah, virtual reality comes to an end in 90 minutes or probably 60 judging from the drop off, but. Uh, let me close out. Um, I mean, first of all, I want to thank Brian for getting the speakers. Um, it was, it, you know, it was, I think he, he just lost conductivity with us. And, uh, you, you know, the United States is trying to emerge from its third world status when it comes to communications. We're, we're not quite up to South Korean or Japanese standards yet. <laughs> uh, which is bizarre, but there it is. Um, I do think the way to look at what 
we're discussing is a kind of canary in our national and international, or I should say allied uh, security cave. And that is, if we can't get going on more collaboration with Japan and South Korea, if we still have information and intelligence sharing issues for expanding the five eyes, et cetera, I guess we kind of know how the story might end and it's gonna be poorly. Uh, because there's, there, as, as one person pointed out, space is a really big place. There's, we don't have enough money or material or talent to work it by ourselves. And I think that's true of each of the countries. I think together we could do a much better job. And we have threats that are emerging, China and Russia in particular, that suggest it's really important that we do well. I can only hope that we'll revisit this uh, topic after we do uh, the submarine question redo with the new government for the next session, when we come and get some good South Korean uh, input on what they might be uh, interested in doing and could do. I, you know, I the the one question I would love to have asked, but we'll we'll uh, just leave hanging. You know, what two or three things would each of you, uh, not just the presenters, but many of the participants, really want to see changed uh, to uh, increase the prospects for sound collaboration in the civil, commercial, and military areas and how they might overlap. I think we need to start thinking about this and acting a lot quicker than we are. On that upbeat note, I think we sort of took a stab at it here. <laughs> And I want to thank everyone for coming.